Today our scripture reference is from the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. I hope you have been enjoying our time together in Ephesians. We're going to wrap it up next, next Sunday. Uh, but today we'll be in chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 17. And we'll be looking at uh, all the way through chapter 5, verse 2. Let us hear now the words of the Apostle Paul. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away from your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling, and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as I've mentioned to you guys before, I grew up in a small town in North Mississippi, Hulka, Mississippi. Growing up in Hulka was a lot like growing up in Pleasantville. That's right. We were had a very sheltered existence uh, living there. And around the year 2000, I was living in Yazoo City at the time. I was serving as a youth pastor. And I went down to New Orleans for a conference for a week. And I remember that, you know, as a kid, I had never been to New Orleans before. So it wasn't until I was 22, 23 years old uh, that I finally made my way down to the Big Easy. And so... Being in the area, I thought, you know, if there's one place a young 20-year-old wants to go and explore, it's the French Quarter, right? I mean, you got to see this place. I've heard about it my whole life. And so one Friday night, the conference was done during the day, and I thought, well, I'm going to drive down, and I'm going to look at Bourbon Street. And so here I am, meandering, and... There it is, Bourbon Street. And I said, well, it'd be cool to kind of drive down Bourbon Street. Friday night, after dark, here I go. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Y'all, it was a sea of people in the streets. There were people everywhere, and the lights. I mean, there was, we didn't have any lights like that in Hulka. I mean, it was the most amazing thing. And I saw all kinds of stuff. My mouth was just 
you know, <laughs> as I was driving, uh, my brain was in certain illustration overload. I thought, man, there's a lot of content here. <laughs> Y'all, it was a wonder I didn't run into somebody. But I made it, and it was some kind of experience for the very first time. <laughs> well, here in Ephesians 4, Paul is somewhat driving us around the streets of Ephesus. It might not be called the big easy, but the way Paul describes it, it might be called the big sleazy. You see, the city of Ephesus was, was a rather dark place. I mean, just listen to the way that Paul describes it. He says, you know, these folks who grew up in Ephesus. He says, I insist that you no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from God in ignorance and their hearts are hardened. They've lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. You see, the city of Ephesus had given herself over to some really profound desires. She was known as a city that was lit up at night, but it was completely living in darkness, mindlessly going along with the crowd, losing touch with God and reality, numb to what's right and wrong, given completely over to what feels good, addicted to every sort of perversion. You see, Ephesus was a city infected with rampant sinful behavior. This was the culture of Ephesus. Ephesus is caught up in a destructive pattern of living, Paul describes here. And this pattern is breaking them apart. It was breaking them apart. And y'all, what Paul is really demonstrating here is the power of sin. When a community, when individuals give themselves completely over to it, it breaks them apart in every level of life. The famous preacher G.K. Chesterton once said, Man cannot break the laws of God. He can only break himself against them. Have any of you ever broken the speed limit? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll take your, everybody just keep your hands down if you've ever broken the law. We've all been guilty of it, right? How many of you have ever been caught breaking the speed limit? Maybe blue lights in the mirror. They give you a ticket. You pay the price. You've broken the law. But just because you break the law doesn't change it. The law still exists, doesn't it? When you go back out there on the highway or that street and that sign says 35, it's going to be in effect no matter if you break it or not. The speed limit remains unmoved, unchanged. Christy McClellan once said, God doesn't hate sin because we are breaking a rule. God hates sin because sin breaks us. You see, God's law remains. We may break it, but it is unchanged. But rather what we find is our lives are affected when we break God's law. It's a destructive path. God saw the brokenness of Ephesus and had compassion enough to send one of his apostles to the city. The apostle Paul. And Paul came sharing the good news of Christ with them. Calling them out of darkness into the light of God's marvelous grace. Paul showed them 
a better way of life. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, hey guys, when I was with you, I showed you the path that God wants you to follow. You were called into the light of righteousness and holiness. Paul showed them a better way. And this first generation of Gentile Christians growing up under Paul's teaching, under his leadership, they're learning how to grow up and to live into this new reality of salvation through Jesus Christ. They're learning what it means to follow Jesus and his ways and his teachings. Paul says, once you didn't know any better, but now you do. You know the truth. Listen to what he says. That is not the way you learn Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away the former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lust. And now you're to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And to clothe yourselves with the new self created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, Paul starts using language about taking off old clothes and putting on new ones. He's instructing the church in Ephesus to change their ways. Much in the same way we change our clothing. Paul says the clothes you wear say a lot about you. And he says to the Ephesians that you're trying to mix and match the old and the new. And it's not really working for you. You've got to decide who you are going to be. What way of life you're going to follow. Several years ago, my wife and I, we were in Florence, Italy. We had taken a little trip over to Italy to tour the country and see the beautiful museums and cathedrals and art. And we were in downtown Florence near the train station one morning, and uh, we were somewhat lost. I couldn't figure out where to go. And so there was a, a young teenage girl on the street, and I, I said to her, Pardon me, can you help me to find the train station? We're not from around here. She said, I know. (laughs) She said, your look, not Italian. Now, I didn't think I was dressed too too bad. I mean, I had a nice little sweater on and some jeans and some shoes. But when I really started looking around, I wasn't really dressed like everybody else around there. You could tell we weren't from around there. Our look was not Italian. My clothes didn't really fit the culture. We stood out in that crowd. Paul says that, the, says that about the Ephesian Christian's lifestyle. He says, guys, you have known a way of life, but it wasn't the way of Christ. It wasn't a kingdom kind of life. There's something better for you. It's time for you to put away that former way of life. You know, during the crusade years, when the Europeans would come to the Holy Land and fight those holy wars, a lot of times they would be baptized before they went off to war. The reason they did that is because they weren't sure if they were going to make it back alive. So they wanted to make sure that they were right with God. Many of them, when they were baptized, they would hold their right arm up out of the water. And sometimes they would be holding their sword in that right arm. The reason they would hold their right arm and the sword up out of the water is because they knew what they were going to be doing with it. And in essence, they were saying, God, you can have everything but this. They were holding something out of the water. 
Paul is in essence saying that to the Ephesians. That they've been baptized. They've entered into this new way of life. But they're playing hokey pokey. One foot in, one foot out. One arm in, one arm out. They're holding something out of the water. Let me ask us that same question. What are you holding out of the water as you seek to live a Christian life? What are you saying to God? You can have everything except this. You know, we do that sometimes, don't we? We play hokey pokey with God. We remember our baptisms and and, and, and we certainly have the strong desire to, to live into the fullness of our Christian lives. But there may be seasons, there may be sins, there may be things that we hold back from God. What is that behavior or desire that is difficult for you to lay down and to give over to Jesus? I want to remind you of Jesus' invitation to us in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, Jesus says, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What did Jesus mean by a yoke? You know, he's bringing two images together that usually don't belong together. A yoke and rest. I mean, when you think about an animal wearing a yoke, I think about that animal being put to work. I think about a burden, not rest. I certainly hope that isn't what Jesus is talking about here. Well, guess what? It's not. That's not what he's talking about. If we could go back to the first century we would learn that every rabbi and every Pharisee had a yoke. It was their teachings. It was his interpretation of scriptures. It was his understanding of what it is to know God and to walk in God's ways. You see, to be yoked with a Pharisee was to walk alongside them, to follow them. To walk as they walked. When Jesus says take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He says that we are to have a better understanding. Looking to him and his teachings and interpretation of scriptures. That we would know the way. The truth. And the life. This is what it means to take his yoke upon us to learn his teachings and he says this will give us rest what is it about following Jesus that gives us rest well according to Jesus we can rest because he is doing the work his life his death and his resurrection were to give us new life it is His power that sets us free from the bondage of our sin. Jesus has already paid the price. He has done the work. But there are ways of living under the bondage of sin that we've been yoked to. And we can't let go of it and we can't lay it down on our own. There are sins that 
oftentimes have a grip or vice on our lives. But Jesus can set us free. Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, declared this marvelous news. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the captives. You see, Jesus invites us to come to Him and to find newness of life, to take on His yoke, His way of living in the world. We are to come into the truth. The truth of Jesus Christ. And when we commit to the truth of his teachings and his way, it transforms us. So what Paul is trying to do is to teach this first generation Christian community how to live in this new identity as followers of Jesus and his ways. And that's why he says towards the end of chapter 4, so then, put away falsehood. Speak the truth to your neighbors. Be angry, but do not sin. Thieves must give up stealing and work so that they can share with the need. He says, we are to let no evil talk come from our mouths, but to build each other up. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Because you've been marked with the seal of the Spirit. Put away from you bitterness and wrath and anger and slander and all malice. And then he says, put on these things. Kindness. Forgiveness. Tenderheartedness. Be imitators of God. As you seek to love like Jesus. So there's some things we're called to put off. Lying, anger, stealing, gossip, critical words, bitterness, rage, fighting, and all forms of meanness. Y'all, there's something in that list that hits each one of us. I know there are a few of them on there that certainly hit home with me. What is it for you? You see, the reason why the Lord is so concerned about our way of life, how we live, it's not because we're breaking rules. But God knows that there are certain lifestyles and behaviors that ultimately will break us. They will break our relationships. They will, they will break us on so many different levels. And God has something better for us. All we must do is allow the light and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to point out those places in us. Trust God to clothe us with the things that Paul talks about here. To replace those things, that old way of life. To grow up in kindness and compassion, forgiveness and love. Y'all, when you think about that list, all of those things are relational, aren't they? They're things that we do and live among one another. We show one another kindness and compassion and forgiveness and love. And Jesus once said that when we live into these things, especially love, He says, by this they will know that you are my disciples in how you love one another. Y'all, we have the opportunity to be a people 
and a church that exists for others and not simply for ourselves. We are called to more, to life more abundant, more purposeful, a life that reflects more of Jesus, to love more deeply, forgive more freely. This is the life that Paul invites us into today. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace that calls us out of our old patterns of living that seek to break us apart, that seek to separate us from you and our relationships with others. A life that can lead us into destructive patterns of being. God, I pray that for each of us here that you would continue to grow us up and mature us into the life of Christ. That your light may shine more brightly in us in the way that we love and serve and forgive one another. Strengthen our community of faith in these things. Help us to be a light in this community that helps others to see Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close out our service this morning. We're going to sing 354, and it's a hymn of invitation. An invitation for us to keep surrendering ourselves to the grace of God at work in our lives. So let us stand, let us sing, I Surrender All. Amen.